It is the 23rd of June. Uh, people are uh, slated to uh, start school here in a month. It looks like we do have uh, the pleasure of seeing Dr. Zink. So if we can say good morning to Dr. Zink, I think that would be super awesome. Um, good morning, Dr. Good morning. How are you, Dr. Blairs? I'm well. How about you? Thanks for joining us. Yes. Sorry I'm late and sorry I don't have a ton of time, but it's good to see your smiling face. Right. No, we, this is great. Um, I What I wanted to do is just kind of run through some resources that I had. Um, I've asked people to put uh, questions in a chat. Uh, it looks like we have a fair number of um, teachers and parents and teachers and parents and all kinds of, and just people that I think uh, are concerned, you know, mm -hmm. about what is going on, which is super awesome. Um, what do we got in our chat here? Cool. Just a bunch of thank yous. <laughs> you can send so, hard ones. <laughs> yeah, no, this this is just a pretty this is a pretty good audience to talk with. But so I think a lot of you guys have, um, and if you haven't seen this, let me know. Um, Matsuburo has, you know, they have uh, some information on their page. They are doing these community events for people who have not seen these. Um, so the twenty first at Wasilla Middle School. Uh, 22nd Sioux Valley, 23rd Sioux Valley. And I actually, so these were informational events and then there was somewhere else that I'd saw that like maybe they were gonna be at um, at uh, the Friday Flynn as well. So, so I think they're working on trying to um, address concerns that people have. Part, um, I think part of the issue in and Dr. Zink, you can back me up on this one or, or, or refute what I have to say, but I think people are really um, hesitant, which is good and bad to go, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we're gonna do it. And the bigger problem is, is because as we know, and I know it's to a frustration to many people, we are still learning. We're learning something mm -hmm. new every day. And so I think people want to return things to normal. Like I will say what is normal at this point um, and I think that that we have to be really uh, mindful of, um, you know, because normal is not going to be, school is not going to be what it was last year. What, what <laughs> we grew up with at school, it, it, it's going to be different in a sense. So, um, and I think we're trying to figure out what's happening as, as Dr. Zink can tell us, like, you know, our numbers are climbing, certainly in Anchorage, they are really nearly logarithmically going up. And, and so part of the issue is how do, do we start um, red zone, green zone, yellow zone, all of these things really <laughs> kind of happening in the community. So, so that's, um, I, I mean, I think that's part of what I'm hearing of frustration for people, lack of a plan. And I think the problem is, is like we've never operated within a pandemic. So mm -hmm. the plan's fluid. And I, you know, I don't know if Dr. Zink, you have some comments beyond that. Yeah, I appreciate all of those comments and, and totally agree. I was on a national webinar recently about uh, planning for school and, you know, they said we're just going to have to be a little bit used to, you know, game day decisions uh, and being very fluid. Commissioner Johnson talks a lot about how every day is essentially a snow day, that the easiest decisions he's had to make as a superintendent are when the weather is below a certain temperature, closed, open, there's a number, it's easy to do. And everyone wants this to be a weather decision and this is a snow day decision where you have to decide are the tires right what does the roads really look like is this too slippery is it slippery enough and it's going to be a snow day every day this year because we're going to have to just keep taking in the data the information the community transmission people's concerns uh community tolerance all of these factors and making decisions on, on what looks uh, uh makes sense for the community what makes sense for kids He's been very clear that he really wants to make sure that education and activity are the constants and COVID is the variable. Um, and so what ways do we make sure that kids are getting education regardless of what place and area it is and that we're able to respond to the science and data and that kids are staying active. And if that is a, you know, a Zoom call to say, today you gotta go do a run and report back to me what that looks like, or if that is you know, in a competition where people are all together, um, that we need to just make sure we're doing those things I think a lot, uh, just my own family, back on the many of the stories I've heard from our Native communities over the 1918 pandemic and 
you know, taking the community out, like this one um, tribal leader was telling me in Dillingham how his grandmother took their family out to the woods for the year, uh, and then they all survived and brought them back. Like, this year is going to be different. This is not going to be a normal year, but no pandemic goes forever, and we will get through this, and we are going to have to find ways to be resilient uh, throughout it. A couple other comments I think about, too, is what ways can we structure this school year to acknowledge its difference? You know, is this a year of service? Is this a year of science? Is this a year uh, of resiliency? Like, what ways can we help uh, empower our kids uh, to be resilient uh, through this change? Um, and what ways can we structure and acknowledge the, the struggle that is there? Um, my kids tell me every day that they are really ready for this to be over, and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, and just acknowledge the way that it is. <clears throat> From DHSS, we are trying to support schools in as many ways as possible. Um, I think if you're up, if you want to enable my screen sharing, if you can, Jill, I'm not sure if you can, but I can share really quickly what were some tools that we're putting up on our website that are public and available uh, for people okay. to be able to uh, use. Um, I could also talk. I about probably that. need to unshare my screen. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. my guess. Okay. <laughs> See if I can stop share. Where there are you? Um, hmm. Chat rename pins spotlight video. Assign assign Dr. Zink as the um, the uh, host. How do I do that? Oh, make host. Oh wait, hold yeah. on. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hey, there's always somebody, thankfully. Uh, no, let's do, do I have you and make host? Yes. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Okay, perfect. Great. Look at that. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yeah. So this is the state dashboard and we have these alert levels that are up. And so these are the number of cases in that community per 100,000 average over 14 days. <clears throat> so we spent a long time looking at European Union, CDC, Harvard's databases to kind of try to estimate the best. How do we present what does community spread look like in your community so that people can make decisions about gatherings, about school, about visitation on long-term care facilities. We ended up doing what are called behavioral health regions um, because they have at least 20,000 people in them and there's a little bit more statistically significant and we ended up going uh, 14 day uh, periods instead of seven, three, 10. We looked at a bunch of those um, and that just really had to do uh, with the number of um, the variability. So, so we weren't having big changes based on a specific outbreak. So if we had an outbreak in a long-term care facility like we saw in Anchorage, those are gonna spike the numbers, but that doesn't necessarily represent kind of the overall community spread. Um, and we wanted to try to have as much stability in those numbers. So we have a couple of tools on here. So here's the alert levels. They are based on, again, the number of new cases per day, over 14 days per 100,000 people. Um, and you can see that the Fairbanks and interior region have been in the red. And if you click on them, you can scroll down and you can see that their nice. the case rate is 15.54 new cases per day per 100,000 people, average over 14 days. Anything greater than 10 is red, five to 10 is orange, less than 10 is yellow. The Matsu just popped into the orange region at 5.86. You can see that Anchorage down here uh, is uh, a case rate of 9.79. So it's orange, but it's a higher orange than Matsu's orange. And so you can follow these to see, and many school districts are using this as a tool. You can imagine that someone like Anchorage's school district where it meets the behavioral health region would make more sense to be able to align them versus other areas like in the interior, you may have a community 300 miles from the nearest case and it's not gonna make nearly as much sense. We aren't saying that these need to be one-to-one, -one, but this is a tool that communities can use to estimate kind of the community transmission. Right. Another tool that people can use is this seven-day case rate map. So it's a shorter time frame. Right now it's resident cases. We're adding a new layer to the dashboard that will have occurrence and then you'll be able to see resident and non-resident cases. That's a little bit hard because a lot of our non-resident cases are in quarantine and aren't mixing with the community at all. And so they don't really possess the same threat. And so we get, like, why are you trying to hide it? Why are those there? We're really just trying to provide accurate estimates of how much the, just the normal day-to-day -day community threat uh, from COVID is there, not just pure numbers, but they'll have both. This will likely include resident and non-resident just as another way for people to estimate it, but that will not be involved in the alert levels uh, for the reasons I mentioned previously. And on here, this is a gradiated scale from this really light yellow to a darker red, and it's a shorter time frame. 
So you can see that after Fairbanks has kind of spiked there, it's now turning orange as those cases are settling down. You can see that the Matsu, while it was orange on the alert level with Anchorage, it's kind of a lighter yellow here at 5.91. Well, you click on Anchorage's and it's uh, at 12.97, so it had a little bit higher case here. So this is kind of a rising risk alert. And then the other thing is on um, this one with the testing, hopefully any day, I keep saying any day, uh, it will not just have percent positive or per, uh, number of people tested, but it'll have percent positive so that you can have a sense in your community what the rising risk is there. So just a couple other DHSS tools as you're looking to support school districts and moving forward. I'm presenting to the education uh, committee at 10. That's why I have to go <laughs> right. to present on some of the data and science um, on uh, kids. We also had, um, there's a healthcare uh, newsletter that is sent out on a regular basis. Um, and we've been doing a bunch on schools. And then Dr. Olson is a full-time staff physician now with DHSS, who's a family medicine dog. Okay. She's doing our newsletters and she has been assigned specifically to schools. So she has been reviewing them and we're always happy to come have, you know, a community meeting, other partner meetings to discuss the, the data and science that we're seeing, what's coming out, but much of the authority of these decisions lie in the school board themselves. Uh, we don't approve plans, we don't disapprove plans, we just give feedback based on the data and science um, and, and wanna make sure that's as, as clear and transparent as possible. So those would be my other kind of thoughts about school. Cool, thank you. So one question that we just got is how does the data account for the populace that's not testing or avoiding testing? Like, <laughs> we don't know, that's that's the estimate I think, and even Dr. McLaughlin has referred at several times, like is, do we really have probably 10% or 10 times the cases that we're actually seeing? Like maybe, I think that- Yeah, you're exactly right. So he estimates somewhere between seven to 12%, probably in that 10% based on national numbers. Clearly certain communities have more resistance to testing than others. And we see that consistently across the state. Some, everyone wants to get tested every week and other ones, you know, very symptomatic for a while and don't get tested. We, you know, we only can have what we have. I think the percent positives is an estimate of that to a degree. Mm -hmm. Then you're only testing the people who are sick and that percent positive is really high. We estimate there's more people who are getting sick. Um, and, and so continue to move down that. The other way we look at it is excess mortality and surveillance and syndromic surveillance. So we're also looking at hospitals who's being admitted for COVID-like illness and yeah. to see what the excess mortality would look like. You could see from the New York data that that really spiked and excess mortality really spiked well before COVID cases were identified. I will say that in the state of Alaska, we were just looking at our June numbers. We really don't have any excess mortality, nor are we seeing a spike in uh, COVID-like illnesses or influenza-like illnesses in the state. So uh, kind of from a background perspective. There are also communities who are measuring wastewater on COVID levels yeah. as another way to estimate community. That's much harder in the Matsu where so many people are on uh, septic tanks, but um, uh, that is just another tool that we are using in some areas. Right. And I think there has been some concern about that when people have talked about even the fact that you can be shedding this in stool for, for weeks uh, after seven or eight weeks after, um, I think one thing that I would say for people, you know, that doesn't mean that you're uh, infectious at that point. It's just we're using basically the technology we're using as a PCR. So it's just picking up like little fragments, if you will, of something. So it's just a way of tr another way of tracking and yep. getting an idea of the, the disease burden, if you will, I think. Um, uh, question, uh, like I know this, I presume this is that edu it's the education committee, you know, it's interesting. I had a conversation with uh, another one of uh, my colleagues that's in the school district uh, and interesting because our school district is not part of this greater uh, collaboration of all these different school districts that are involved in some of these meetings. It's fascinating. Um, and I don't know the exact reason uh, for that, but the Matsu Borough School District is not involved in these, and it may be because of, I, my my understanding is maybe there's a league similar to what we belong to. Uh, for me as a city council member, like the Alaska Municipal League, I think there's a school, Alaska school board kind of thing, which people can, and districts can opt in and out of. So that was my only guess, but I don't know if you know anything about that part of it. I don't know anything about that part of it. Unfortunately, um, I'm learning. I learned a lot about seafood and now I'm learning a lot about the politics of school boards. Um, there's a, a lot of different levels of all this. Um, 
and, and yeah, so I don't know that specific. Usually we try to attend everything. We have this DEED and DHSS team. Uh, and so Dr. Olson, who I mentioned, Erin uh, Harding from DEED, Barbara Pennington, who's a school nurse lead, are kind of our threesome. We kind of think of them as like the three pillars of this. Yeah. Three of them try to attend all of this because there's a lot of levels of that that our team doesn't understand very well, but then DEED does. Um, and then we try to provide the health component to it um, in combination. So that's our our threesome. And we're always happy to like come to, again, meetings. Uh, we've had representatives uh, in the Anchorage district who had a big public town hall meeting. A lot of Metsu people showed up and said, why aren't you talking about us? And we're like, because right. it's supposed to be about Anchorage and Anchorage's plan. Um, but we're always happy to, to come to those. We are happy to come to school board uh, meetings, but our authority um, is not, you know, we are, we're here to offer services, but we can't really force services unless the governor mandates something uh, differently. So um, right. I question a lot. So I don't um, have, have people, you've probably heard this, I know you're a parent. So one thing that really, really kind of one thing that prompted me to actually have this conversation and be able to try to have a conversation about this is in the last couple of weeks, I've talked with some folks that are parents and me really realizing how uh, stressful this has been in term, just in from a parenting standpoint of like, mom, can I go for a bike ride with John? Mm -hmm. And mom's like, um, you know, normally it'd be like, yeah, where are you going? Like not, and not thinking about that necessarily. Um, and now like just the, the layers of complexity and, and I think not being a parent, I think about those things all the time because I'm trying to think about myself and keeping a practice open and serving the people that I need to serve, but like from a parenting standpoint, I haven't really thought a lot about that added layer of stress of like, wait a minute, I need to call Johnny's mom and mm -hmm. all of those things. And I'm, I, you know, clearly you are in it, even in a, an entirely different situation with your kids. But I think that that's really been something that's really been brought to my attention in the last few weeks. Yeah, I mean, we were having that debate this morning <laughs> with my kids about a hike and uh, what that would look like. And, uh, and, and the pressure that I think is being put on kids to also make these decisions, you know, if we're like, listen, these are the things that are safe or not safe, and their friends have a totally different normal. I mean, my youngest was like, we were talking about school, and she's like, if it's a, a matter of me having to make that decision, I don't want to go to school because that's, I, I'd rather do it at home. I don't want that pressure that you're going to want me to wear a mask, you're going to want me to not give hugs, and I can't do that. I mean, so I'm seeing like my own kids choose to pull away from that school because we're not setting those standards within school and making those norms uh, for them. And it's heartbreaking to watch, honestly. Mm -hmm. And to see, I also think a lot about parents who are trying to work and balance kids at home. Right. And kind of people hung in there in the spring and we're like, well, we'll get through it, but fall's coming. And now fall's here. And the thought of you know, a friend of mine described, she's like, I feel like I'm looking into this dark, deep abyss of thinking about the, what the fall looks like and trying to balance work and kids and there's a lot of kids who did not thrive with online education um, and are really struggling it's emotionally and physically so important for them to be with friends to growing my kids are middle school and high school i mean it is the time for them to like spread their wings and fly and then we're like never mind you get to hang out with your parents more it's not exactly their like favorite uh <laughs> setting um but uh it's challenging again i keep thinking back to um that chief in in dillingham about taking his family to the woods for a year and the pandemic, you know, passed and, and th things will change, things will get better. And I keep talking to my kids about, this is really hard, but this is temporary. This won't last forever. What ways can we be resilient in this? Because um, it is, and I, I just, parents right now, I mean, I've had my kids bust in in the middle of some big presentation, and knock on the door and kids crawling on people's laps. But I also think that there, there's a uh, a silver lining to all this and realizing that we've all been trying to balance these things in different ways, that we all have lives outside of work and that it's, you know, a, a one of my uh, colleagues, you know, is breastfeeding and she oftentimes goes off the screen and just feeds the thing and she's like, well, I can do this now and I couldn't have done it in my office beforehand. Uh, in what ways can we normalize it? What ways can we help support each other, making sure that we're connected, thinking about the mental and physical health of each other. But this is, I, a friend of mine said recently, she goes, it isn't just hard thinking about school this year, it's sad. It's mm -hmm. sad to think about how, how much we're having to give up because of this virus and, and because it's not um, under control. And that, I mean, I, if anyone attended the school teacher meeting yesterday, I got a little choked up at the end. I was just thinking about it. Um, it's sad. So um, 
but I, I think it's okay to acknowledge that and uh, find ways to move forward through it um, and know that we're better off supporting each other. So, right. Yeah, thank you. Like, I think the same thing, like I've really been trying to help people focus on what, what can we do? We know this is out there and we don't, we're still learning and we're going to continue to learn every day, but what can I do today to support my own resiliency, mm -hmm. my family's resiliency, because we're, I mean, it's just such a weird thing because I think people are also like, we're, we're afraid of it. We're, you know, and it's almost um, like who got it, who got it in the community, you know, like, and, and I feel bad that it's kind of that way because it's such a mystery. And, and I'm, I, I don't want people to be shamed. Like it's a virus. Like we're all, we've had coronavirus before. We haven't had SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. but we're probably all going to get this. So the bigger thing is, is like, what, what can we do to improve our resiliency? What can we do to improve the resilience of our children? And I like the idea of focusing on something like I've been focusing on immune support. How do we support our immune system? So when we do come in contact with this, hopefully it will be a mild case and not the ICU case. And I think helping kids see that too. And I like your idea of focusing on what can we focus on? Mm -hmm. for the year. Yeah. So I think that helps to keep us out of that mindset of running from versus like, let's make a choice, let's make an active choice. And I think, you know, also when you're just thinking about parasympathetic and sympathetic states, which we've mm -hmm. talked a lot about within the practice, like it doesn't help us to be in that fright or flight mm -hmm. all the time because we don't have our thinking caps on then. It mm -hmm. impacts our immune system negatively. So yeah, I appreciate the idea. And I, I, I wish that we would see more of this like, okay, hey, what what, what kind of uh, lemonade can we make out of this situation? Yeah. Well. I do have to run, but yeah, yeah, here's a year of resilience or a year of outdoor education or a year of, you know, small bubble connectiveness or, you know, my husband has really taken it as like, this is my last year to really bond and be with my kids before they're off to college as their high school and middle school. So he's like, I'm going to make the most of it. And they're getting to be really good pack rafters this summer. I will tell you, That's <laughs> awesome. keep them distracted, doing something else uh, so that they're not missing their friends, but keeping active is really important. So, <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Zink for joining us. Thanks and, for the opportunity. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I hope you have a great rest awesome. of your day. You too. Bye guys. Yeah.